ultimately I think architecture is utterly about people, you know, and about uh, sort of making life better for people ultimately. So, you know, understanding the human component of it is going to help you to get there. Episode 103. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I'm speaking with the extraordinary Sarah Wigglesworth. Now, Sarah is the director of her London-based practice, which she founded in 1994, and her work is widely acknowledged as a pioneering influence in British architecture, and it focuses on exploring ecological building solutions. Um, Sarah writes and speaks extensively about her practice's work, and she's quite an exceptional speaker if you ever get the good opportunity to see her talk and she was granted the title of Royal Designer for the industry in 2012 and an MBE in 2003. So in this conversation Sarah discusses the future of her architectural practice and how they've been dealing with the Covid situation. She talks about how the practice has blossomed and how it's grown since those early days, how she reconciled her professional work with her academic work and of course she goes into detail about the story of building Stock Orchard Road, the fabulous house that she did with her husband Jeremy Till Um, and she also discusses about their the practices work in the public sector, the complications of procurement in the UK and most importantly how she builds a team culture within her practice. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Sarah Wigglesworth. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work. But it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself. We can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of. And I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you were headed to business wise in 2020. So there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Sarah, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. Absolute pleasure to have you. How are you? I'm really good, thank you. I've had a good lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, yeah, so how, how's, how's lockdown been impacting your business or how, how have you been adapting? Well, we, we've been really busy, which is odd. And I think it's probably the fallout from the Brexit sort of uh, pipeline going a bit dry for a while now coming through. Um, so oddly enough, we've not, we've only followed one person for a very short space of time, an admin assistant, and they are now back. So, um, we've all been working merrily away on our various projects at home, but actually my situation is weird because of course I've got the office next to my home. So actually Mm. for me, it's pretty much business as usual. So I've got everything I need here from printers to computers to everything else. So it's been lovely. So, so, you, so you were set up well. <laughs> I was set up well, yes. Anticipated very well 20 years ago. Um, and it's really been very business as usual for me. A bit lonely, but, you know, mm. I can put up with that for a bit. How, how, how have you been um, ad- adapting in terms of communications internally with your, with your, with your team? So we've been using various bits of online technology like everybody has. I mean, we set up on Teams very, very quickly when we all went into lockdown. And we've been using Zoom as well, but it's mainly Teams within our practice. Um, Obviously, there's, uh, you know, Outlook and other emails and things like that. We have, I mean, we have regular meetings throughout the week, which we've all just continued to have as normal. Um, 
And in fact, in many ways, things have got much more efficient because, of course, we're not traveling anymore. And so we don't have all that travel time. Um, we have sort of regular Friday night catch ups, uh, e drinks, we call them, <laughs> and other things like that. And we have lots of little CPDs and um, EDI coffee breaks and things like that, where we talk about the various. Um, uh, you know, characteristics that we protect characteristics, which we're all um, sort of interested in finding out a bit more about. Yeah. So lots of info sharing and stuff like that. And we're attending webinars. So actually it's pretty much um, business as usual. And actually I find it quite sociable, except it's just a screen, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 sort of post lockdown, when the office kind of comes back into, into action, are, are there certain elements of this way of working that you're going to maintain? I think we will. And I think it's not just um, ourselves, but I think clients will be demanding it as well for lots of reasons. Um, I mean, they not, may not be going back. We're already talking about potentially some members of the practice who aren't reliant on public transport to come um, and maybe reopen the practice around early July. Um, if that works for them and they're happy to do it, then we can do that because we've got a lot of space here and we can, do, you know, set up our desks so that it's quite distant from each other. Mm. Um, I mean, there are issues around it, but I think we have strategies that we're putting in place where we could get around that. But I think um, remote working with meetings and things like that, I'm definitely sure that will continue because I think everybody's realized it's actually very advantageous for everybody. Um, so, you know, we can have, I mean, we've had, I've had design reviews online, uh, planning meetings online, uh, client meetings online, and I've just come out of an interview for a new job online. So, you know, it's actually amazing what you can do and save schlepping halfway up and down the country all the time, you know. Yeah. So it's great. Why, why wouldn't we continue with it? I mean, I think, I think it's been the thing that sort of uh, forced everyone to get with it on the technology, which has been around for a while after all, mm. um, but we just haven't done it. Um, not and, sure why. <laughs> and, and have you found that it's in, it, it's made perhaps the, the parts of the creative conversation more difficult or has it facilitated new types of ways of, you know, that kind of, you know, a lot of architects have been saying that have been concerned about that spontaneous looking over to someone's shoulder and making a comment on their work. Has, I is, think that is missing. Yes, I'd agree with that. Um, and I think what one of the things it's done for me is made me think a lot about how work isn't just work. I mean, it, you're building a culture and you're building a society in many ways, a little mm. society. And that social side of things actually has great importance, you know, because being in the same physical space feels like you're literally physically building something together mm. um, and the sociability side of things just the little bits of banter the things you pick up by what people are saying in the office you know you catch someone who may be having a hard time those kinds of things you know they're very nuanced but they're quite important for just making sure people are happy mm. and getting you know getting a able to do their work well yeah so I think that is missing, and I and I and that that, that I don't think uh, the web's really substitutes for that. Yeah, um, I'm interested to hear if we kind of just go back a little bit in in the past about how how SWA came to be. What was how did the practice start? Well, that's a good question. I mean, it started. Uh, with probably sort of just absolutely stupid, naive, youthful hubris, really, because, <laughs> um, I mean, I, I suppose what really happened was uh, I got a little bit of disillusion quite early on with what I'd term sort of conventional practice. And I suppose, I mean, I'd had a great time in my master's at college and when I went, uh, and obviously, you know, after that was sort of, you were putting up with stuff because you were sort of learning how to become an architect and getting your professional qualifications. But after that, it's a bit like, well, there's this great sort of wide horizon stretching out ahead of you. So what are you going to make of it? And mm. hoping that, and I was expecting practice to be sort of super stimulating and super 
um, interesting and, you know, great conversations like we'd had at college, you know, and actually I found it a bit dull and drudgy and no, none of that stimulus really. And um, so I started teaching and that precipitated something quite interesting, which was that essentially I was told by my boss at the time that, you know, if I wanted to teach, then I wasn't going to stay in that practice because they didn't support it. And so I sort of went out and I got another job and boxed and cops with the teaching. And then eventually I sort of realized, well, actually, I'm kind of getting to the point where I think I'm unemployable because I don't really want to work for anybody anymore. And by that stage, you know, after a few years teaching, I was sort of really kind of beginning to think about what I wanted to do. And I mean, teaching was great, actually, in many ways. And it was a sort of learning curve for me because it was, it's like, an amazing opportunity to pursue your own interests, but with mm. 30 other people, you know, and set your own agendas and set your own sites and, you know, and read up about stuff and just basically kind of educate yourself and then have these fantastic conversations with very talented people. Yeah. And, you know, um, so at that point I, I sort of penny dropped and I thought, you know what, I, I think you just better go out on your own. But it was the most stupid decision because I didn't have any clients and I didn't have um, any money, <laughs> you know, I just had my teaching job. And um, I mean, I left the practice I was with and, and joined forces with a friend and we um, took a job away from that practice, which kept us going for about six months. Uh, and after that, it became clear that actually I didn't really know what I was doing at all. And uh, well, we didn't. <laughs> um, and it was a question of just sort of trying to make a go of it. And I mean, there is, not, I mean, well, of course, we were cushioned financially by the teaching work mm. and stuff and had, you know, these amazing ambitions about what the practice could be about, um, really fueled by, by the university that we were working in. Um, but, you know, actually, there was a massive disparity between the sort of back extensions and very humble kind of domestic work that we were beginning to get and some conservation work and the sort of elevated ideas that we were playing with in the practice uh, sorry in, in, in education um, and and in a way but in a way that was amazing because that also sort of led to um, an idea about you know what is the everyday and what are these sort of humble jobs and how amazing could you make them and mm. what does it mean to build for yourself and you know all of those conversations that you know were really live for us at that moment and and the and the sort of disparity between ambition and reality you know when you have to deal with regs and planning and clients budgets and clients conservatism and risk and all of these things that kind of come into play between mm. the elevated ideas you have and the reality on the ground you know and actually it was that that eventually led to us building stock orchard street because it was a bit like well if we could buy a site and do a project, it'd be really interesting to see how far you could push the boat out to actually try and get closer to mm. those things we were talking about in college. And so in a way, it was a bit of a self-provocation. So, I mean, long story short, I mean, my apprenticeship was, you know, doing very mo modest and humble stuff for quite a long time and not really having any way out of it but, and working on my own pretty much to suddenly deciding, you know, with my partner, Jeremy, to buy, uh, to try and buy a site and see if we could do a development and just sort of try it out. And I'm, you know, I'm a real believer in trying it out. <laughs> so so Stock, Stock Orchard um, is now celebrating what it is, it's 20th, it's 20th anniversary yes. this year, yes. right? Um, yes. And ha what was the impact that that building had on your, on your career and the, and the, and the sort of shape oh, of your... Practice. Complete turning point. I mean, um, I mean, during it, we were, I guess, just sort of in the shadows and working away at it. But I mean, once it was sort of in the public realm and built, um, you know, I mean, just wasn't expecting the response that it had at all. And it completely changed the trajectory. I mean, I think there are a number of things that happen. I mean, from my for myself, I mean, uh, building it was an education in sustainability, uh, you know, and how to build green. And, and that was quite deliberate because I got very interested in sort of um, ecological buildings and, and environmental design mm. while I was teaching. And, you know, that was quite a big plank of what we were trying to do in the studio. Um, but, and I actually, I 
toyed with taking a course in environmental design and modeling and stuff like that. But actually, when this opportunity came and we thought about buying a site, I, I mean, then I thought, well, actually, I could do that and I could get a diploma. But actually, on the other hand, I could build a building, you know, and actually, I'd sort of probably get more, you know, whammy out of it by doing that and learn much more yeah. by actually building something. Um, and as I said, I'm a real believer in sort of uh, learning by doing and sort of, you know, gathering knowledge that way, practical knowledge that way. Yeah. So essentially it was a sort of, edu I educated myself, you know, well, Jeremy and I did, uh, by just lapping up everything we could about um, how to build green. And I guess, I mean, the prevailing dogma at the time really was sort of um, Walter Seagull's self-building stuff. Yeah. And that that was our sort of touchstone. But we were trying to uh, do many more things than that. So, um, you know, just recently we've done a retrofit on it because in the meanwhile, obviously, lots of other things have come along, like Brianne came along and Lead has come along and Passive House come along and all the rest of it. And, and actually the green movement has, has shifted quite a lot and grown quite a lot and become mm -hmm. more sophisticated and the software available has become much better. And so we've now done a kind of audit and a retrofit on the, on the project, which has been a really interesting uh, sort of way of catching up and getting back up to speed mm -hmm. and also seeing the difficulties that are presented by retrofit. You know, it's definitely not an easy thing. How, how, how did you first acquire the site? Because it's, it's in quite a great location by, yeah. by the, by the, up in King's um, Cross. Well, we, we bought it at an auction and we'd been looking for about six or nine months, I suppose. Um, and we'd gone to a couple and hadn't managed to buy anything. And we didn't have very much money. But um, what was lucky was that it, it was basically at the end of a recession. And so there were not very many developers crawling around. Mm -hmm. um, that was the first lucky thing. The second lucky thing was that um, it was just as uh, British Rail was being privatized right. and so they were selling off lots of little pocket sites adjacent to railways of which this was one it was owned by british rail at the time and um so so it came up for auction and there was a tenant on it and the tenant was a forge and we expected the forge to buy it but they didn't buy it they they were apparently told that it had some flaws in the retaining walls and so they didn't go for it um, and, you know, in many ways, that's kind of a shame. I mean, they were a tiny industry and they uh, they were making leaf springs for under motor vehicles, vintage vehicles and things. Um, but on the other hand, it's quite a niche, small industry. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so we just managed to buy it. I mean, we were not outbid, which is amazing, really. <laughs> um, so little bits of luck, you know, came our way. We were... Yeah, really fortunate. And, and, and did the, the process of doing the build yourself and having it as your own home, did it lead you ever to think, well, maybe we could, we could do this as, as developers or was that something that never, didn't appeal? We did think of becoming developers. Um, but I suppose, I mean, one of the things about building this building was, I mean, at the time I had maybe one or two employees and um, gradually the, this whole project just took over my life. Mm. And, you know, gradually one by one, these employees dropped off and I ended up um, not even having an office somewhere else, you know, moving my office into this sort of half built building and going through lots of ups and downs of like, you know, am I going to survive? Is my reputation going to survive? Am I going to come out of this with a building? Am I going to come out with any money? You know, uh, this is professional suicide, et cetera, et cetera. Lots, lots of doubts. And, um, uh, you know, it was a really difficult time, actually. It was extremely mm. challenging as a project. And um, I I don't know. I mean, I think coming out of it, I mean, that was the turning point. Because when I, when, you know, people sort of began to talk about it and, you know, there was responses to it, then I began to think, oh, you know, maybe we do have something quite interesting here. And um, maybe, you know, the effort and, 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 and uh, difficulties have been worthwhile. But it did take a while to get over that and to sort of reboot things and sort of think afresh about what the practice might mm. be like. Yeah. Well, what were some of the, 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 the major risks 
whilst you were doing the doing the project? Well, I mean, the the biggest one was working next to a, a public utility like a railway line. You know, there were massive, massive sort of uh, restrictions on what you can do and how you can do it, and you have to pay for people to watch what you're doing all the time. Every time you work within three meters of the railway line, they have to send people down. You have to, we had to erect hoarding against the line to make sure nothing fell on it. Um, all of which we had to pay for, by the way. Right. <laughs> um, uh, there were method statements that needed approving, you know, that was, I mean, like dealing with any public utility, only in a way it's worse because obviously if anything fell on the line, it could be a fatality. Yeah. So that's really difficult. Um, I mean, it was a former industrial site, so uh, there, there may, to, may have been contamination. I mean, actually, we did sort of tests and it wasn't that much, so we were very lucky there. Um, that we did find some underground structures and things like that, but, I mean, nothing we weren't able to deal with. Um, I mean, otherwise, I mean, the risks are, I mean, it was a massive building. It was much more expensive than our budget, so we completely <laughs> misjudged that. <laughs> Um, we didn't have anywhere to live <laughs> for a while and lived in a caravan for nine months while it was being built. We couldn't afford security. I was the security officer, wow. you know, stuff like that. I didn't have anywhere to, uh, uh, to, to work after, I mean, we, we, we hired a little space up the road, but when it became clear that, you know, money was really running out and we were going to have to sort of batten down, I came to work in here and, you know, with dangling light bulbs from illegal, uh, you know, wiring <laughs> and things like that. <laughs> so it was very, very unglamorous. Um, and, you know, I mean, just lots and lots of risks and, and kind of feeling, God, I mean, because when we went into it, you know, I never thought that we wouldn't achieve it. Mm. And, and then, but halfway through, I began to think, God, you know, could, could fail. You know, this could be the biggest disaster and kind of massive beer moth. And, um, you know, this is just going to be professional suicide. Yeah. And I'm going to be poor and I'm going to have no other <laughs> <laughs> So wow. what, what wasn't a risk, really? <laughs> and, and, and so did, did you have other projects going on at the same time? We did have clients. a few, but I mean, gradually this thing just took over. That's the thing. Um, and I mean, you've got to bear in mind, I mean, when we started, as I said, we were in a recession mm -hmm. and we had somebody do a cost plan at stage three and then um, who became our contract manager, Martin Hughes. And um, then we came out of recession and suddenly, you know, the market started to heat up and we couldn't hit any of these cost targets. <laughs> so everything took miles longer to try and procure. And we were constantly making kind of VE amendments to design and this and that and the other. And um, I think, I mean, the other, the other personal thing that was quite, I found quite difficult and it is difficult is um, being a client and an architect is like a sort of Jekyll and Hyde, you know, part of you is like, oh, pull it back in, you know, save money, uh, don't do those things, you know, and uh, say, you know, save, um, and being really cautious. And then the other side of you is going, no, 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 this is a, an amazing project, and it's a once in a lifetime opportunity, and we've got to push the boat out on design, you know, <laughs> it's all getting more complicated and, and more expensive. <laughs> so, you know, um, unfortunately, I think the architect tended to win out. <laughs> <laughs> does, does does that experience and now kind of lend itself when you're working with uh, now when you're working with clients that you're massively, able to massively, massively. I mean, I think you know that's the one big takeaway for me is I became so sympathetic to clients as a result of that. I mean, I really understand what it is to go through a, a project where a lot of things are at risk in your okay. life. And I mean, mostly the architect, I think, is trying to shield the client from that. But I think having gone through it, I'm much more empathetic and I am able to understand how difficult it is. And in fact, I think one of the one of the sort of unmentioned difficult things, I mean, obviously money and risk and dirt and mess and things like that are horrible. Um, but I think... It, it's quite a burden being a client. You know, there are millions of decisions that you have to make and many of them are really interconnected and you don't understand how they're interconnected when you're not mm. in business. Yeah. And so um, I think it is quite tough, actually. And I think part of the architect's role is to try and 
um, assist the client and guide them through those quite difficult um, decision making processes and sort of lead them to making the, the right decisions, if you mm. know what I mean. Yeah. Which is not to say you're trying to uh, sort of hoodwink them or anything, but it's, uh, it's perhaps helping to limit the choices by guiding them in the right direction so that they, you know, they do the right things kind of thing, like but- non slip or, you know. Uh, this, this is a very interesting point actually is, is you know when we're dealing with clients you know, real people um, and the the kind of art of not overwhelming them with too many decisions yeah, to make yeah. that can kind of you know and also you've got to demonstrate leadership in trying to you know direct the, the course of the project and mm-hmm. you know and then manage all these these conflicts and also yeah that as you say the empathy towards um, the, the you know what they've what they've got to deal with in their life as they as particularly so. and you know and they're not doing it as their day job either you know they're doing it weekends and evenings and things like that when they've got all sorts of other things going on you know so um even just visiting you know the tile shop or the sanitary wear supplier or the brassware or you know the carpets or whatever you know all of that just takes a lot of time and it all needs coordination so I think it is quite tough being a client, actually, and I think one of our roles is to na- help nanny them through that and make it a bit easier. So, so uh, after the completion of Stock Orchard um, project, uh, how how did you start winning new projects? Or because obviously you, you had the coverage from Grand Design, I seem yeah. to remember it was like one of the one of the first episodes of Grand Design, wasn't That's it? That's right. That's right. Well, I think. I mean, I guess. And then it hit the press big time, but I think um, basically until about three or four years ago, we never had another client come to us, ask us to design them a house, which is wow. quite interesting, isn't it? Very interesting. Yeah. And I, I won't say any more than that, but I'll leave you to wonder <laughs> why that might be. <laughs> um, but I, I mean, I think... I think one of the things it did was it raised kind of lots of uh, puzzlement and questions, but I think it planted an idea about a sustainable building that hasn't hadn't really been around um, up until then, mm. which is things like self build reuse of um, you know sustain uh, well sort of recycled materials that kind of thing. But actually our work began to come from people who, with whom I think our sort of understanding about sustainability more broadly uh, resonated. And that that came by complete accident through some links we had with Sheffield, actually, and the classroom of the future. Mm. So there we had a client um, who was a special school, which was a special school, and they wanted a very um, sensory and tactile a uh, place for teaching ch- children with special needs uh, about science and and that was really interesting because i think the dfe's idea about a model classroom for the future was actually all about high technology but for these children that wasn't really appropriate so mm. the head of school and ourselves would devise this brief which was actually all about you know classic science which is observation and um recording what you see and experiencing it so um that gave us this great opportunity to make a tactile environmentally conscious building which was part of its landscape was in the green belt in sheffield and so it was a sort of gift in terms of what lay outside there the badger sets and there were birds and bees and there was a pond and you know all of this stuff that kids could get out and Mm. get dirty with um even if they were in wheelchairs or whatever you know we had a big ramp down and everything and then the building itself you know you could sort of it, it was full of materials you could touch and feel and uh you know that were really tactile and sensory it was lovely yeah and, and in a way that that i think partly sprang from the rich material palette that was already embedded in stock Orchard street so if you wanted to sort of draw a line linking them together that might be it you know um and it also had a soft play area in it as well which sort of and we worked with an artist you know that was full of lots of lovely things about how to make a really um stimulating and enjoyable environment for children for whom you know physical um, experience of the world was really primary you yeah. 
Yeah. And, and then the schools thing sort of snowballed from there and we've got more schools and, and so on and so on. And I mean, since then, we more or less worked completely in the uh, public sector. You know, we've very rarely worked for, we have done, but we've very rarely worked for uh, private individuals and developers. Um, and, yeah. and, and, and making that move into the public sector, obviously public sector work um, is notoriously, well, it comes with a lot of obstacles to well, obviously in yeah. procurement and also how projects are won. How do you go about winning that kind of work? What are the, what are the things that work? What are the things that don't work? Well, that's a good question. If only I knew. <laughs> I mean, I think, uh, I think it's a very dark art and I wish I could manipulate it better. Um, but we obviously do some public tenders. Occasionally we get invited to a uh, to, to do a tender, um, which is a sort of shortlisted tender, you know, because somebody's sort of pre-qualified or something like that. Um, we do get on frameworks uh, now and again, um, but then you're still competing for the work in that. And I think, you know, what basically a company's public sector work is the requirement to always have competitive nature of some kind of procurement, mm. be it, you know, pre-qualification and then like a framework and then a mini comp or something, or, um, you know, an open OJU or something. Um, and I would say that typically we don't do terribly well at that kind of thing. Um, and I, I would say our success rate is probably quite low, but probably actually quite average, to be honest. I think, um, I mean, there are benchmarking figures that show that we should be doing much better. But then I think anecdotally, we're probably not doing much worse than other people. Yeah. I think, I think as time goes on, we've also decided that we need to try and do more of really, in a way, what we did at Stock Orchard, which is to try and make our own luck. So make links with the people who we think are really great to work with and, um, you know, try and forge relationships with them um, and then try and do good work so that we get repeat work. And I mean, we have managed to do that with some clients. So that's, you know, that's really nice. So, so being on a framework doesn't necessarily equal any, any kind of work whatsoever. No. No, it becomes a sort of pool of pre-qualified people that you don't have to keep asking the questions about your liability insurance and things like that, but um, that you still have to compete within that for the work. So it might be limited to maybe three firms that are drawn off that. Um, but I mean, some of these frameworks have like 70 architects on them. So your chances of getting something might be quite small. Yeah. And obviously, and, and do those frameworks, I mean, I know, I know like with, you know, kind of the large infrastructure projects, those frameworks will get updated every few years. So you will have yes. to sort of reapply to, to, yeah. to remain on them. Very much. Yes. And we've been on frameworks where we've hoped to get on again and sort of build the relationship and then we get thrown off them. So we don't ever do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, they're typically about four years long. Um, but I mean, since the typical life of a project might be, anything like four years you know you might be lucky only to get one um i mean unless you know you're very lucky or or maybe very big with a massive reputation and, pe and you're just the go-to people you know yeah obviously one of the um constraints that you know and and kind of concerns we hear a lot in the architectural industry is is about the ability for smaller practices or emerging practices yeah. to be able to enter into frameworks or to enter in, into you know designing schools and there's you know there's no shortage of talent and there's no shortage of yeah. these practices being able to to be able to, to deliver on that work yeah. what what sorts of advice would you give for those types of practices trying to win public sector work and also on the second part of this question how would you how would you like to see the system changed if at all um, okay, well, I suppose, I mean, we feel a bit ambivalent about it and it's very difficult for me to give advice really, but I suppose, I mean, I think we, we still feel at quite a disadvantage of being a small practice and I think it, it's not that common to find small people work, small practices working in the public sector. I mean, I think mm. that's fair to say. Um, I, and my advice would probably be to just stick at it actually and try and identify 
the players out there who share your value system and there probably are not that many really and so you want to target those and um, try and you know not give up really and get experience of how to do them and the kinds of things you have to do to, to jump over the mm. hoops and try not to get too disillusioned um i mean we and we go in waves you know sometimes we just get really fed up with them and feel quite poorly treated and other times we um you know we feel it's good to be on them um so yeah i mean i think i think the way that we deal with these things in the uk seems to be quite uh, bureaucratic and laborious and I know from the work that people like Walter Menteith and uh, Ross Kirchhoff have done on pr for Project Compass mm. that the processes do not have to be like that yeah it can be very much more simple but I would say uh, you know that the clients have to do a bit of work in order to do that and one of the things they probably have to do is take a bit more risk uh, we've just been through a qualification period with Southwark, London Borough of Southwark. And that was, you know, they did a bit of market engagement before they uh, decided on the criteria they were going to adopt. And actually that was really good because, you know, you went to meetings and you could give them feedback on what they were proposing and they took it on board and they changed what they were going to do and they made it a bit simpler. It was still quite an involved process, but believe me, they did actually listen and they did change what they were going to do mm. for them. Um, but even so, I mean, Walter Menteith talks about uh, processes that exist under OJU in uh, say Holland where you know people are asked to put forward you know two A4 sheets with what they can bring to offer a project <laughs> so you know that's the sort of thing it would be really lovely to see here where you're actually trying to tap into the very talents that people have rather than making it a tick box exercise of just filling in forms about your liability insurance and your PI yeah. and, and your, and your ISO 9000 processes, you know, um, which is what many of them are. And I think that many of them are because there's a sort of sense that, um, the more boxes you tick, the more due diligence you're doing, but actually what that doesn't do is it doesn't address what it is you're trying to achieve. Yeah. out of this project and if a client could focus on that and then create the process which actually gets them the answer to that question then that's what this process should be about yeah and it, it, you know, small practices are never going to compete on the pi and iso 9000 things you know which are just processes they're not about the product at all yeah um, and often a small young practices who are really hungry put in much much more effort to make a project happen than a, a large firm who can rest on their laurels so you know i think i think clients can get a bit more savvy about the way they procure things actually and it would be nice to see that do you, do you think this is part of the architect's role to be educating their clients and also the public sector in in alternative methods for procurement well I think we should be doing that more. And I actually am critical of Reba for not doing that more. And I think one of the problems is, is that um, I think those processes probably serve the kind of strong people in our um, industry quite well. And they have whole teams devoted to these things. You know, we don't do that. We, I mean, I have to do these things, you know, um, when we apply for these uh, frameworks and, um, so, uh, you know, possibly there's not the impetus coming from the top that wants to change it and mm -hmm. that has really big influence with our institute. But I mean, I think that that's not serving our profession very well because we know that about 80% of architects are, you know, one and two man bands or something. So, um, you know, they are never going to get, I mean, they're excluded from this process completely. Mm. Um, and we'll never get a bite of that cherry. So, I mean, opening it up um, it is a process of making it more simple and easier for people to compete. But, I mean, in a way, in a way I, I also slightly feel that 
um, in all of these things, you know, we're just pitted against each other all the time in competition. And I'm slightly fed up of competition. And I mean, we live in an age when there's so much information about work out there. You know, all of us have got websites, all of us have got buildings that you can go and visit. And so often I don't find clients interested in going to do those things. So they don't come and visit us. They don't talk to us. Mm. They don't visit our buildings. They don't seem to know our work. So it looks like they haven't been on our website. And you think, well, why are we doing all the work? You know, you're the people who want the building. <laughs> yeah. why, don't, why don't you actually find out about us? You know, there's so much out there about us. Mm. Um, and, and I think it's really important that, uh, that clients do do that because in the end of the day, you're, it's a matchmaking, you know, it's actually got to find the right people who are going to understand what it is you're trying to do. And, um, you know, I mean, it's like buying anything. You want to do your homework and make sure you're getting the right, uh, right solution to your problem. And yeah. you do, and I think you do, I mean, I think the, the people really matter. Uh, ab- absolutely. And, and it, it becomes less about, relationship building and assembling the right mm-hmm. team and is and it becomes more like treating it like a commodity exactly exactly and, and i don't think it is i mean ultimately i think architecture is utterly about people you know yeah. and about uh sort of making life better for people ultimately so you know understanding the human component of it is going to help you to get there absolutely yeah absolutely in in terms of on on that um talking about you know architecture being about the human component how how have you developed your your business with a focus or developed your business culture and relationships well i think that's really important because i think one of the um things that kind of spells your empathy is sort of how you treat your staff and trying to build a culture where everybody feels valued and um, so, I mean, I've tried really hard to sort of make it a, a plank of our practice that um, everybody has a contribution to make, no matter what level they're at. I mean, obviously, there are differences in experience and all the rest of it, and people have different s- skills and they have different takes on the world and different experience to bring to bear and all the rest of it. But in the end of the day, we are trying to be bigger than the sum of the parts, mm. and everybody has a, a, a part to play in that. So, and in many ways, I'd say that the model for what we're trying to do is a bit like running a studio in a school of architecture. And I think that's not a surprise because I think in a way I was formed on that, uh, you know, anvil. And, um, And so I... You know, I'm really interested in ideas and I'm really, in, I'm really curious and I want to know what's going on. And I'm really interested in kind of keeping my ear to the ground with what's the real agenda behind this project, you know. And you find those things out by getting in with people, you know. Um, and that's the same with this office as well. So I try and draw out what's everyone's individual contribution to the practice and try and get them to find what are the things that they're interested in doing because I don't think it's any use asking people to do things they don't really want to do. Yeah. Um, however, they might not know that they might like it if they don't, you know, try it out and see. And so it's about, it's about trying to sort of draw out the best in everybody and value them for what they can bring and, um, and get them to, you know, exploit those talents as much as possible. Uh, and and how, how much involvement does everybody else on the team have with the running of the business aspects of the, of the practice, like, you know, setting fees and the kind of profit and loss accounts and these types of things yeah. and, and winning work um, as well. Yeah. Well, we try and devolve that as much as possible. Um, we have an operations manager here who uh, sort of manages the finances, but mainly the responsibility for delivering the jobs on time and budget is with the project architect. Yeah. And so they would be drawing up the fee proposals. I mean, they might run it past me or the associate Ellen of Ruff or whatever, but um, ultimately it would be for them to do that. And of course they need tutoring in that, you know, so if somebody joins our practice as a grad, as a graduate, um, they, they would be sort of, uh, brought up uh, and given these things to do gradually and supported in learning. Um, 
But I think that's really important because ultimately, you know, they're responsible for delivering the projects on time and within our fee budget. Um, so every month they, I mean, they would draw up invoicing schedules and every month report to our um, ops manager about how the project's doing and we record all our, you know, the time spent and we get uh, uh, sort of data out from that software every month to kind of monitor how we're doing. And we have a Monday morning meeting every week to kind of monitor how jobs are running and where things are going slow or where things need support. And we're constantly juggling staff around mm. to try and maintain continuity or whatever. And um, I mean, that sounds like people are constantly moving, but they're not. It's just that somebody may need a little bit of help out on something because they're trying to get something out. Or it may be that a job's gone on go slow and so they're suddenly not busy and they can get on with something else and it might be a bit of publicity or it might be you know working on drawings that can go up on the website or it might be managing the website everybody's doing that all the yeah. time so it's not you know we haven't got a hierarchy where you know you're the person that does the detailing or you're the person that only does concept design it's not like that we're all we're all doing pretty much everything i suppose that's one of the, the sort of the joys of of um, smaller practice is that everybody does get the holistic experience exactly. of being able to to see everything that's going going exactly. on i mean you know people have different strengths and aptitudes and inclinations about doing this stuff but on the whole i think we do follow up what might be regarded as a bit of an old-fashioned model at that level because I'm a believer in a kind of rich and varied diet and I think mm. you can get really bored doing the same thing over and over and over. Um, but at the same time, you know, if there's a gap or somebody hasn't had a bit of experience in, say, detailing for a while, and then, you know, we might put them on doing some detailing so that they get back up to speed again and manage to work with somebody who can help them out or whatever, you know. Uh, yeah. And... In, in in the last sort of few years of growing your your practice, um, has it always been a conscious decision to keep it the the size that it is, or has that been? Um, well, I've never wanted a large practice. I mean, I suppose I've never thought that it would ever get bigger than about twenty. But actually, we've only uh, only ever been about fifteen, right. and it's just grown organically, and it's sort of waxed and waned as time goes by. Um, I, I mean, I guess, I I don't know. I mean, it, I, I don't think I've had, well, I think I've had some ambitions to try and grow it, but partly because um, I think if you've got a team of about 12 to 15, then you've got a good cross-section of people at most levels and you can do quite a lot of work with that, you know, yeah. possibly you've got two or three teams or maybe more working on different projects and you, um, you know, you, you, you've plugged a lot of gaps. That, that's quite a coherent team. Um, more than that, I think is difficult to manage. Mm. I mean, we would need a different hierarchy here and we would need more management in inverted commas, you know, <laughs> And I think the flat hierarchy that we've got would change a lot. And that would be a different a practice than we've got at the moment. Um, and actually, we probably couldn't support that, to be honest, yeah. um, unless we changed a lot. Um, but, you know, even 12, I've found quite difficult to manage actually all on my own. And so mm. you, do need, you do start to need to have a kind of structure um, with people who can be more managers. But I think I think one of the things, um, you know, our people sort of say is that they don't want to just go into management. You know, they didn't become architects to become managers. And we're not that kind of practice. So we don't, nobody really wants to just do that all the time. Mm. And before the appointment of my ops manager about two years, two and a half years ago, I mean, I was doing all that stuff and doing it really badly and not enjoying my job, you know. And so um, having got someone on board to do that now just feels lovely. You know, I can go and do the things that I do well and, and enjoy the work. And I think that infects the practice as well. I think that communicates to people, you know, and um, makes the whole mood much, much better as well. So, if, you know, if I'm happy, everyone's happy. <laughs> Brilliant. And we were, um, you were talking earlier as well about 
sustainability and how you know the the stock orchard road house was kind of um embodied a lot of ideas about sustainability yeah. um it, in terms of the architectural industry and the future that we are, that we're facing yeah. how, how how do we or how in your experience do can architects effectively sell sustainable ideas to clients well that's a good one isn't it um i think you've got to make the arguments around that it's the right thing to do and then i think you've got to back that up with i mean ethically right you know and mm. right for the planet and then i think you've got to back that up with really good arguments about how it's going to also impact upon them personally in terms of comfort levels and enjoyability and health and their well-being and those kinds of things as well and i think i mean i think we live in an interesting moment right now because i think suddenly well-being has become a really big thing yeah but actually well-being i think is a subset of sustainability because you know non-toxic materials good ways of transportation uh you know healthy things to eat um good air quality you know um warmth and um non-drafty environments all of these in good daylight you know they're all actually playing into the sustainability agenda mm. so um in many ways it's a sort of no-brainer and I mean, it may be, you know, possibly it's a little bit more unfamiliar or even a little bit more expensive. But then once you factor in replacement costs or, you know, your ill health and you start valuing slightly other things in life rather than just capital cost, mm. you suddenly, it, it just makes lots of sense. So those are the kind of arguments that I would make around it. When you're dealing with clients and perhaps you're wanting to um, pursue an ambitious architectural agenda uh, mm. or, or sustainable agenda in, in, a, in a building project, how much or, or, or do you ever try and correlate that with their, with their business agendas? Or how much research do you go, do you go into to their sort of Oh, a plans? lot. Oh, a lot. Yeah. And I mean, I think there is some... Um, I mean, when you say business agendas, I mean, I'm not talking about, we don't work for commercial clients, but we yeah. work for, say, housing associations yeah. or developers. And, I mean, I've noticed a huge change in their attitudes. You know, 20 years ago when Stock Orchard was finished, it was very, very niche. Um, but now people are really knocking on the door and they want to do these things. They want uh, much more um, sort of reliable, um, low-energy buildings and particularly um, housing associations where they retain um, management of their own stock, you know, so it becomes an investment for the future. And they're also, they have a remit to kind of look after uh, the most needy in our, in our society by, you know, eliminating fuel poverty and giving them um, good sort of fulfilling uh, spaces to live in which mm. are really healthy and good for their well-being you know and help them to kind of fulfill them their lives so that's a good client to work for in a way because you you know that they're pushing on all the right buttons so you know and now they're making much more demands about sustainability it's really good to see so instead of us trying to goad them you know they're they're asking us how do we do it and that's fantastic um, and, you know, we're working with um, a blueprint in Nottingham at the moment on a, um, a scheme at Trent Basin. And they're, you know, they're, they've got their own um, sort of sustainability criteria called Footprint, which is a sort of lens through which they see their work. And they're trying to go green. They're trying to go MMC to get the quality of product higher and uh, also cut costs and make it more attractive for people to want to buy them. Because I think people, consumers are now much more focused on um, what my energy bill is going to be, you know. Yeah. Um, and that's true particularly of people who have a diminishing income, like people on pensions and things like that. Um, and... We're working in Croydon with Brick by Brick and they are adopting the One Planet Living criteria as well. Um, so, you know, it's actually cha a changing scene and it's changing really fast, which is great. I'm really pleased to see it. 
Fantastic. Amazing. And in, in terms of um, the sort of where you're going next in for the rest of 2020, what's the, what are the plans? Well, we've got loads of schemes in the pipeline and actually we've also got loads that are about to be published but can't be because we can't get the photographers in <laughs> for COVID, which is really annoying and frustrating, but um, we're slowly getting there. So I think, um, I think you've got to watch this space. I mean, the thing that's just kind of come out is our retrofit of Stock Orchard Street, which has been this sort of eco retrofit. It's been really interesting to do. Mm. Um, what's coming up is hopefully we'll be able to publish a new home, which is a multi-generational home. Uh, for three generations of the same family. It's an eco house in uh, sort of northwest London. Um, so those two are completed but can't be photographed yet. <laughs> um, and then we've got lots of housing coming through the pipeline. Our brick by brick houses are going forward, and so is the Trent Basin going into planning. We've got other jobs in Nottingham about you know setting off towards planning. Um, and it's mainly housing at the moment, but we're still very, very interested in doing schools because we love to do schools. And one of the reasons that we love it is because you get to deal directly with the clients who are going to use your building. And that's such a pleasure, you know, as I said, you know, because they always give you the clues as to what the, um, the solution to the, the design is, you know. Um, and as I said, you know, I'm really, I'm curious and I'm really interested in sort of what are the drivers behind the project, you know, so you get, you get, you get the brief written down, you know, it's all rather sort of um, straightforward, you know, areas and schedules and things like that. But actually those are not necessarily the things that are driving it. So I'm always mm. interested in what is the motivation, for them, what are they really trying to achieve by this building and how do we do that? I mean, since my, um, I mean, you know, I was at Sheffield for 19 years and towards the end of that, I was running a research project called Dwell, which is designing for well-being in environments for later life. And I'm really interested in uh, sort of designing housing for people throughout the life course. But starting with the older age group, once you sort of look back down the other end of the telescope, you realize actually if you're designing for that age group, it works for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. So, and it's more like lifetime homes with slightly bigger space standards and slightly more flexible arrangements that could allow you to have a carer to stay or start a business or, you know, even if you, you know, if you break a leg and you're 25, you know, and you can't get in your flat, that's a problem. So, you know, these kinds of things tend to be the things that happen to older people, but they can happen to younger people as well. So, um, you know, that's really interesting to me. And we're working with uh, uh, a local authority at the moment to look at a whole estate that involves a school and a housing estate which had sheltered housing on it but they're now thinking about how to offer new multi and intergenerational housing um, mm -hmm. as a combined site, which is also really interesting. So you've got that entire age spectrum and crossing over between housing and schools, education. So, you know, very nice projects sort of en encompassing our entire range of expertise. So that's really nice. That's just feasibility study, but you know, it kind of lays all the groundwork down yeah. and I really like that because getting in at the early stage is really important to um, setting the agenda for the project mm. going forward. In interesting, you were just saying there as well about some of the, your completed projects, they're not able to be photographed just yeah. yet and then, and, then, uh, and then be published. How, how important to you as a practice in generating new work is, is publishing and getting your work published? Oh, what is it, what, it's what, become what, really important, yeah. I mean, my, a lot of my early life was spent writing kind of academic or quasi-academic articles, you know, research, and, and actually talking about our work as research, because I see every project as an opportunity for research, and that means trying to identify you know, what is it that we want to learn as a practice from this project? How are we going to push our knowledge forward in this? Mm. And that may be something that we do just in-house. I want to learn about CLT or we want to learn about a SIP system or something. It might be technical, but it might also be an engagement uh, agenda. You know, it might be all kinds of different things. Or it might be, oh, we're going to do this in BIM because we haven't done that before, you know. Can, can range and sometimes our clients are reeled in on that and sometimes they're not because it doesn't really bother them as long as we yeah. do what we need to do um 
So there's that. And I think the research strand, you know, we try and, and, and sort of thread through everything. And there are obvious links between projects where we're taking knowledge and then like adapting it or, 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 or spinning it in a different way or whatever. But, um, and we, and, you know, we try and publish things and uh, talk about it on our website, write features, uh, get stuff published in magazines, uh, and you know tweet and instagram and all of the uh, tools that you have um out there now so you know it's from long more academic things right down to a few sound bites and a picture you know and i think it's all important you know it's all about just sort of trying to get your message out there fantastic brilliant i think that's a, a fantastic place to conclude our, our conversation so sarah thank you so much for your your time your expertise and inspiration this thank evening your interest my pleasure Brilliant. and that's a wrap thank you so much for listening and don't forget to book your 15 minute chat with me by using the link in the information i look forward to speaking with you the views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and i make no representation promise guarantee pledge warranty contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.